The Wood Whisperer is sponsored by Powermatic, the gold standard since 1921. And by Clearview Cyclones, clear the air and breathe easy. Well, welcome to another TWW Live. Uh, this is the third one. Yes. And it's getting better every time. At least I think so. And that's all that counts, right? Uh, of course, I'm Mark. This is my wife, Nicole. Hi. And we run a little website called The Wood Whisper at thewoodwhisper.com where you can get a lot of free uh, mm. videos and tutorials and articles plans and plans and, and other things you probably don't care about. In July, we gave away a Powermatic drill plastic. Drill press. Sorry. We're working out. We're working uh, out. It's early in the morning. What do you expect? Yeah, 10 a.m. It's very early. So the big winner <laughs> is Ryan. I knew I was going to watch it. Watch, watch T? Why, why Chi Chi? You have an email, Ryan. Ryan. So make sure you respond to me in the <laughs> Ryan, next 48 hours. I, I'm, I'm going to pronounce it Watch Chi Chi because that sounds, <laughs> that sounds more fun. So congratulations, Ryan. Yes. You are now the proud over, owner of a drill press. Right, and because it's a new month, we're starting over. Yes. New giveaway. What is it? It's the, a clear view. Yeah, yeah. 1800, is it 1800? CV 1800. Uh, dust collection, I can't talk this morning. What is wrong with <laughs> me? <laughs> <laughs> Let me help you here. A clear uh, view CV 1800 cyclone dust collector. This. With filters with filters yes. and and this is what i run in the wood whisper shop mm -hmm. here and if it can work in this 1800 square foot shop you can see a little picture here shows you my setup if it can work in here it can sure as heck work in just about any other shop out there mm -hmm. um, it is really powerful it will uh, as my stepdad would say suck the balls off a brass monkey and if you're interested in this, go to thewoodwhisperer.com slash giveaway. You could sign up for this. Mm -hmm. We also have a video up there that we did uh, a number of months ago um, covering the installation mm -hmm. of one of these units because it is a little bit of a DIY thing, and that's, that's why you could save money when you purchase one of these units. It's one of the best uh, bangs for the buck out there in, in dust collection, and that's why I've been using them since, well, shoot, I got it soon after we moved to Arizona, yeah, pre-Wood pre Whisperer yeah. days. Uh, and now we're lucky to have them as a sponsor of the show. And you're lucky to have them as a sponsor of the show because stuff like this happens. Uh, first of all, I do want to mention a little bit of self-promotion here. The Wood Whisperer Guild in September will be starting a new project. We're going to be doing the Krenov Cabinet. Uh, well, it's more of a Krenov stand. It's a sort of an open cabinet. A uh, really beautiful piece, classic piece, and we'll be beginning that little journey in September. So if you're interested in that, go to thewoodwhispererguild.com and you'll get all the details. If you sign up for a one-year subscription, you'll get that as part of your subscription. Uh, we do have a new Wood Whisperer store now, which is pretty cool. We moved to a whole different platform, much simpler, much prettier, much nicer to, uh, to look at the items. We're not a real complex store. We don't need a big fancy uh, system like we used to have before. So this is very simple, looks great on mobile. Close this window, get out of this stupid live thing and go buy something. <laughs> Go buy a t-shirt, it's urgent. All right, so this was uh, something that came across my plate in the forum. I noticed someone mentioned the new SketchUp viewer. Now, me personally, this is something I've been waiting for for a long time. I do a lot of work with SketchUp. I'd like to see my various models in SketchUp, and uh, they came out with a viewer for both iOS and Android. Orbit, explore, and present your 3D models and browse the entire 3D warehouse with the SketchUp mobile viewer tablet app. Available today for iOS and Android tablets. I actually did download it. It's, uh, it's $9.99. Uh, so you can see in this screen I've got all basically the projects that I have access to. I even uploaded one of, a couple of my own here. And then when you go into the viewer, you can sort of orbit and pan around your projects, look at your different views, uh, the better constructed your your file is, um, you know, with different views, the better and more useful it's going to be in the app. This is not necessarily, it might be a little disappointing for some uh, folks like you and I who want to tinker with these models. You want to be able to look at the measurements. Even if you have pre-dimensioned parts in your file, it strips those out for the viewer. The other drawback is you do have to have these files in the 3D warehouse. Uh, but if you do upload your files, you can make them private in the 3D warehouse and then access them. So if you don't want to share it with the world, that's one way around it. So check it out. Um, we'll put the links, of course, to both the iOS version and the Android version in the show notes. Margie's great AUK, A-U-K, AUK, 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 kayak. Uh, this thing was built by Omar. Here's his story. He says the project began three years ago at the 10th annual Cape Fear Community College Boat Show. Materials were purchased in 2009 and a first strip was applied to the molds on uh, June 19, 2010. The fully outfitted boat had her inaugural launch on July 2nd, 2011 in Wrightsville Sound. The boat was displayed 
at the 2011 Southport Wooden Boat Show and won for Best Non-Power Row Paddle. That's pretty darn cool, huh? Now, if you, uh, if you want to submit your own project, you can do that. Just go to thewoodwhisperer.com slash submit. This one comes from Steve Jordan, and he says, I just stumbled upon your videos about two weeks ago. I want you to know that my father died four years ago this week. He and I had a wood shop together for personal use, and I'd been by his side since I could walk. I have not had the desire to pick up a tool since. I have, though, half-heartedly. Uh, watching your videos has helped me... Uh, Sorry, has helped to inspire me to get going again. My wife and I are finishing our new house, and I've been given free reign to use our three-car garage for the new shop. Thanks for doing what you do, Steve Jordan. And it's emails like this that just kind of, you know, make it a lot more fun to get up in the morning, knowing that we might be able to positively impact someone's life like this. So uh, that's awesome to hear, Steve. Thank you for writing in. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, or maybe a week ago, I posted a video about a vet who builds in his garage shop and gives a lot of the things, the furniture he makes, to the Air Force Base families um, who are in need. And he's building these things for free and giving it to the families. Well, he's been doing this for a long time, and now his HOA is telling him to stop. And this really created a lot of buzz on Facebook. Uh, here's a video where you can check it out. He's been building furniture out of his garage for more than a decade and then donating it to military families in need. But now his homeowners association is telling him to stop. That I may not paint, sand, cut wood, or screw on the property. The new mandate cuts deep. Dennis Coker has been building cabinets and dressers for a Here's decade, a donating most of them to military families. Even as a nonprofit, the Vietnam veteran was told to get a business permit. He did in 2012, but this March, the Lake of the Pines Homeowners Association took it away. Now they've come back to me and said that it's, I'm producing odors and noxious fumes. Such complaints typically come from neighbors, but 12 of them have written letters supporting Dennis and his work. Dennis has stopped building furniture for now, but he vows it won't stay that way for long. I'm going to keep that fighting spirit. We have, you know, HOAs have a really bad reputation, you know, and this kind of thing doesn't help. Uh, it seems like someone who's been, you know, maybe it was against the rules of the HOA and he's been getting away for it, getting away with it for years now, and then suddenly they want to clamp down on something like this, and it sounds like they keep upping the ante trying to dissuade him from, from doing his thing, and then suddenly he gets his business license. He, he does everything he's supposed to do, but they still want to shut him down. Um, when I posted this, it was very clear that the, the world really hates HOAs. Um, they can really be brutal. The thing is, there are some HOAs that aren't that bad. We live in an HOA community. And, you know, thankfully, it's actually a really reasonable HOA. I mean, like any HOA, there's some issues sometimes that you're like, what are we talking about here? Uh, but ultimately, they do keep the home values up. They make sure everybody's properties look good. But they don't, they're not as bad as some that want to dictate what's in your backyard, you know, every little detail. So uh, we're pretty lucky with ours. But clearly, this one uh, is on sort of a power trip with this guy. So I really feel for him, you know, because you establish this pattern. This is just, you know, he, he's clearly retired and this is what he's doing with his days and someone is going to come along and tell him not to do it. Um, it's just it's just tricky because the thing is a lot of the comments that came in on Facebook were like you know talking about our freedoms uh, in this country and that it's a shame that someone fights for our freedom and then can't exercise his own freedom but the problem is here's the thing with freedom you're free to give away your freedom right and that's what happens when you sign into an HOA you are agreeing to give up certain freedoms and you know, I don't want to play sort of a right and wrong game because I absolutely side with, with uh, Dennis in this case. But there is a part of this that says, look, you signed a contract. Um, you gave up that freedom when you agreed to live in an HOA neighborhood. And it's something I'm prepared to deal with if my HOA comes down on my butt for something that I'm doing. So um, it's a tough situation. I really feel for the guy. If there was anything I could do to help him out, I would. Maybe publicizing this is, is about the best thing I could do. Um, and hopefully they will relax their hold. Uh, Steve Carmichael at the Carmichael Workshop built a Whirly Gig for the Whirly Gig Wars competition that's going on right now. Uh, and he built something called, it's basically a game consisting of multiple Whirly Gig called uh, Whack a Woodworker. And yours truly is one of the featured woodworkers. So I got a real kick out of this. Here's a clip. Hi, welcome to Whack a Woodworker, the interactive Whirly Gig arcade game. Today's panel consists of five famous woodworkers who inspired me to start making my own woodworking videos. So what better way to pay tribute than to whack them on the head with a mallet? Whack a Woodworker has five propellers that turn independently. Our panel of woodworkers pop up as fast and as random as the wind blows.
Awesome stuff. Great job with that, Steve, and thank you for uh, beating me in the face with a mallet. Steve strikes me as the, the kind of guy that I'd like to share a, a rack of ribs with. Yeah. You know? Nice guy. Um, the other thing about this is Laney Shaughnessy, I believe, is the one who's kind of uh, spearheading the campaign and the event, uh, Whirly Gig Wars, and I'll put a link for his video explaining how you can enter the competition. Uh, there's a lot of um, a tie into the Make-A-Wish Foundation, so anytime you're doing something with charity, uh, let me know about it because I like to spread the word when possible. So uh, we'll put the link there for that as well. So hey, good luck everybody who is entering and hopefully you raise a lot of money for the charity. Uh, here's another thing that came across my plate. Instructables, you guys probably have seen that website. Well, someone put together a list of great woodworking projects for beginners. All right, Instructables, I think it's you know, kind of hit or miss depending on who's writing the article, the level of quality there, but um, either way, a lot of times with this stuff, you could just look at the pictures and, and figure out how to do it. Um, but great inspiration here. If you're new to woodworking and uh, you're not really sure where to go with it or what to build, you can find some great ideas, especially for, you can see here, some great stuff for the house. When you're starting woodworking, there's no better way to get your spouse's approval and support on something like this than building things that you can actually use in the home. So what I want to show you is what I consider to be a basic toolkit for a beginning woodworker, someone who is interested in power tools, uh, but you're not necessarily ready to commit to the big power tools, the table saws, the band saws. So what do you need to get work done? It's really not that much, right? Look across the board. I've got a couple of hand tools here, all uh, hand power tools. Of course, I am a big fan of Festool. I love the quality. I do this for a living. So for me, Festool is absolutely worth the investment. It may not be for you. There are tons of brands out there that will give you quality results and last a very long time that aren't green and black or dark blue, as the case may be. First of all, a router. A router is really the, one of the best multitaskers in your shop. You can do jointing with a router. You could do flush trimming. Of course, joinery, you could put, a lot of people just think of the router, they think of uh, edge treatments, you know, OGs and roundovers, but it can be so much more useful than that. And if you build jigs to support the router, uh, you're really gonna, you know, exponentially increase the amount of things that you can do with it. So a good quality router, preferably a plunge router. A fixed base router is okay, but a plunge router is really gonna allow you to do a lot more in, in terms of mortising and things like that. It makes it easier to use, it's more multifunctional that way. I do recommend a random orbit sander. If you're gonna get one, get a six inch. I think the extra real estate saves you time. You've got more sandpaper on the surface, uh, so it actually will be a time saver for you. But random orbit sanders, I like them better than quarter sheet sanders because they, say, they sort of sand in a random orbital pattern, which isn't noticeable to the eye, right? You get a lot less of those uh, little pig, pigtail squiggly lines. So random orbit sander, I think, is essential. A good drill. All right, you don't necessarily need to get all different types of drills, just a standard drill driver like this for drilling holes and driving screws will do the trick. Okay, a good quality circular saw. Even if you don't have a good quality circular saw, even a medium quality is gonna work. Or if you have a, a low budget uh, circular saw, just put a better blade in there. The blade will make all the difference in the world. And I'm gonna show you a way to get better results out of this that are very similar to what I get from my Festool setup with the track. You're gonna like that. All right, by the way, you'll be using this to cut sheet goods. You can use it to cut solid wood if you have a wide enough platform to work with. Uh, but if you wanna work with plywood, MDF, things like that, circular saw is gonna be your best friend. Now, you're also gonna need to cut curves at some point. I do a lot of this with a bandsaw, but you can do most of that curve cutting with a jigsaw, right? It doesn't really have to be a high quality jigsaw because a lot of times those curves, you're gonna sand them afterwards or maybe use a file or something to clean them up. All right, so this is it for the power tools, but if you get into woodworking, you absolutely, I, I believe, you can't ignore hand tools. They're essential to doing good work and to, to, to really increase your versatility and what you can do as well as your skills. So a good set of chisels is essential, quarter inch, half inch, three quarters, and one inch. If you have those in your collection, you pretty much have your bases covered for the most part, but chisels are going to be, I don't know, I use them on every single project. Something gets touched with a chisel at some point. And a good multi-purpose saw, okay? Now a lot of people with all these other sort of cutting implements and things, don't necessarily think that a handsaw is all that useful, but you'd be surprised how many binds this will get you out of, all right? And that is what I consider to be the basic toolkit. Now you could step this up. You could upgrade from a jigsaw and get yourself a bandsaw. 
You could stop relying so much on your circular saw and get yourself a table saw. I mean, uh, you could take the router, flip it upside down and put it in a table. And now you've got even more functionality. So there's upgrades, you know, up the wazoo. But for now, if you're just getting started and you want to do some of those things, like in that Instructables uh, link that I put in there, these are tools that are going to allow you to do that. And if you shop carefully and maybe look at the used market, you can get all this uh, for a, a pretty low price. So I'm going to show you a jig that I use. Now here is a Festool track, right? And this to me revolutionized the concept of what a circular saw can do. Because the saw travels along the track, there's no slop. You basically put this right down on the line, so you measure your lines, drop your guide on the line, and you cut right to it. This is the kind of thing that a lot of people are trying to get now through less expensive means, and I'm gonna show you exactly how you can do that. This is a homemade track. Now, it doesn't lock in in the same way that the Festool might with, um, you know, those little, it basically has two rows that lock it in so it really has no slop. Uh, with this, you can move away from it if you're not careful. Uh, but all this is, is a piece of particle board. You can use MDF, you can use plywood, whatever you want. And I've got this little uh, MDF strip. It's about a quarter inch thick and it was sold at Home Depot. Don't know if this is in every region, but it was in mine. They call it bender board but it's just a strip, I mean, at this size too. It was uh, just a little bit longer. Um, sold as bender board, and it's just quarter inch MDF. This serves as the fence. So our saw basically just sits on it like this, and our blade is cutting right on this line. So we're getting a lot of the same advantages that we get with that Festool track. Right, so this is gonna go right along this outside edge. We'll clip this piece off, make sure I'm not cutting into my workbench. That would be disappointing, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, or yeah, or the cord. And I'm just going to cut right through it. The key, though, is I'm keeping pressure up against this small little bender board fence. Now, a huge part of the quality issue that you get with a circular saw, whether or not it cuts cleanly, comes from two things. It comes from the blade. So you want a blade with a lot of teeth, a nice, good quality blade. And also this track, the track's contact with this top edge is what gives us a nice clean cut. Now we went with the grain of the veneer, so we did stack the cards in our favor here. A cross cut across the grain would have been much more, uh, a much better test, but we would have gotten pretty decent results. But I don't know if you could see that edge. You zoomed in on that? Mm -hmm. It's pretty darn clean. The, the base of this is actually just shelf material from Home Depot. It's got a bull nose on the other end. So I just bought a six foot length of shelving and this bender board. Uh, the way that I attached it on there is just with glue and a couple of brad nails. Use a straight edge or, you know, if you have a level, a four foot level or something that you know to be straight. Uh, all I did was put the level or the straight edge up against it. Hold it nice and tight. It's already pretty straight. We just want to make sure it doesn't skew at all. Make it nice and straight and then secure it to the base. You put it in a little bit further and when you make your first cut, you establish your cut line on that straight edge so it's always dead on from then on. So you can make these of all different sizes, use some different materials to make it a little bit lighter for yourself. You might even buy some, uh, maybe some grippy kind of material or something to simulate what, what the Festool track has. It's got that little foam there, plus this little strip. Add those to it, you're gonna get a lot of that functionality. Now, no, it's not as good as the, the Festool track, but we're talking about doing things on a budget with limited tools, and this is something that's really gonna up your game quite a bit. So, keeping with our theme of simplicity, I have a book here, and this is not necessarily new. I think I've had this for a year or two, but uh, it's a good opportunity to tell you about it. Ridiculously Simple Furniture Projects by Spike Carlson. And we'll put the link to Amazon so you can purchase this. And of course, if you buy through our link, that actually does help us out. We get a small kickback from Amazon, so we always appreciate you using our links. Uh, it's $15, and you can take a look at the cover there, see some pretty nice projects. But the real magic here is the simplicity in which the, uh, the, the, the way they were designed for construction. Um, and the tools, right? The tool set that I just showed you is the lion's share of what you're going to see in a book like this. All right, and even though simple is the key, we're not looking at like low quality furniture here. We're looking at very high quality furniture just built in a simple way. Uh, you know what, I'm thinking I may write a new book. I'm gonna call it Ridiculously Difficult Furniture Projects, <laughs> just as a fair counterpoint. 
what I do a lot of times between projects is I photograph the previous one. And I have since added some really cool backdrop stuff to my shop. And I get a lot of questions about how I photograph my work. And I've got a couple examples to show you. I'm gonna actually show you my setup over here so you can see what I actually do. And this is new to me. This is the first time I was able to do this. I just added that to the shop about six months ago. So what I've done is I installed some photographic backdrops. These are paper backdrops. And you can see we have three rolls up there, which I have to be honest is overkill. But having never really done this before, I wasn't sure what background would work the best for me. So I got a white, I got a dark gray, and then I got a beige, right? And uh, it's actually a really cool system. If you look over here, I've got these chain driven um, thingy mabobbers. That's actually what they're Pulleys. called. Yeah, it's sort of pulley thingies. Uh, and this will actually allow me to retract and pull down the paper. Uh, the great thing about this is you put the backdrop down, doesn't matter what's behind it, it covers pretty much everything. You put your project, obviously the bigger it is, the harder it is to, to do this, but most of the stuff I build will fit within the confines of this size. Uh, put your subject here, and of course you need lighting. Like This is good, but you do need supplemental lighting to make this work. Okay, just those little, um, compact fluorescent deals, all right? And I shine those. Now, uh, here's the thing, if you want to get into photographic lighting, there's a lot of great resources out there and you can find out about like your basic three-point lighting techniques. Um, if I had the skill and ability and time, I probably would look into that type of thing. I know about it, uh, I just don't practice it. So I find that two decent lights will give me good results because the key is I just want results that look professional enough. I'm not trying to compete with a professional photographer here. I just want it to look decent, All right? So I have my two lights casting light in both directions, create some nice shadows, and we get really good results with this. I, I also have larger um, box lights, uh, light boxes that will cast a huge amount of light on the scene. Sometimes it's overkill for this. Sometimes it's just right. You could dial them down a little, but they're big and bulky, so I don't keep them in the shop. So this setup works really well for me. Now, the camera I use is a Canon 60D. It's a really good camera, especially for someone like me who isn't really <laughs> all that into photography. Um, but I bought this when I wrote the book. Um, I needed quality photos at a level that I didn't ex you know, currently have the ability to take. So uh, this was a good compromise and has turned out to be a really good camera for me. And that's what I take my shots with. But I'm gonna show you some pictures that I took with my iPhone. And because of this setup, they're really darn good. It's kind of showing you that you don't necessarily have to invest a thousand dollars into a camera if you've already got one on your phone and your lighting situation is just right. Each one of those chain drives is $38. So if you can find a way, like even if you buy the brackets, the brackets themselves are $30. You don't have to have all three of them populated or you could just go find, look at them online and maybe make something of your own. It probably isn't too difficult. But 30 bucks for the hooks, um, $38 for one of the drives, and then your paper roll, depending on what you get. Uh, mine was about $65. So it's not that bad of an investment if it's something you're gonna use on every project and makes your work look like it's been professionally photographed. So this is the recent Gary Rogalski jewelry box project. All that was done is the setup you just saw, I laid the, the jewelry box on the ground toward the back and took a picture with my Canon camera. And I don't even know a whole lot about custom settings. I mean, a little bit of knowledge about using custom settings for your camera will go a long way. So you can get your focus right. You could, um, you know, stop using the flash, <laughs> things like that. And you can get really good results, all right? But this is an undoctored photo right off the camera using that setup. This is the Morris Chair Project, just recently completed. That one is doctored. And this is really the secret to a lot of my pictures. When I can't get perfect lighting, like right off the camera, uh, I have help, my good buddy Funk, John Funk, does some great Photoshop work, his wife does as well. Uh, one of them, I don't know who actually does it, but um, they do a lot of uh, post work on these pictures. Here is the same shot pre-Photoshop. So all he did was uh, remove some of the shadow lines, brighten things up, and also you notice I've got a little bit of background on that shot. Look to the left and to the right, where you could see to the outside extremities of the paper um, this actually, here's, let me go back to the Photoshop version. Boom. Cleans it up real nice. And like I said, good enough. I'm not looking for absolute, you know, this is going to stand up to the best photographers out there. I don't need that. This is good enough for me to post on Facebook and for people to go, oh, ah, which is actually my ultimate goal in life. 
Here's a shot, same setup with my Moorish chair using my iPhone. That doesn't look too bad, does it? And that's undoctored, by the way. That was just for test purposes. I wanted to take a picture to prove a point specifically for this to show you what it looks like uh, using, and not that the iPhone has a bad camera, the iPhone has a very good camera, um, but it's something that's along for the ride with my smartphone as opposed to you know, an $800, $900 camera um, that I invested in for the purposes of taking pictures for a book. You don't necessarily have to go through all this stuff, but if you want to, there's a great resource for lighting, and I use it for all of my lighting needs because it's incredibly budget friendly. Steve Kaser Lighting. I believe the guy's located in Southern California, and I will put the link directly to his site in the show notes. Uh, great lighting kits, great prices on big soft boxes, light boxes, and uh, little photographic kits like this. You can even get those little uh, tents that sort of open up, and it's a light box that you can shine the light in and take pictures of smaller items like that. He says, once the learning curve is over, our hand cut dovetails just as easy and fast as a jig. I use a porter cable jig and it's easy and fast. Hmm, that's a great question. Here's how I see it. Uh, jigs are fantastic when you're doing multiples. So the more drawers you have to do, the more useful that jig becomes. Now, even, I have a lead jig, and I know the porter cable is similar in a sense that you need to consult the manual when you're setting it up. And if you do it more you know, frequently, you'll be able to do the setup without having to consult the manual each and every time. The time investment it takes you to master the jig could very well be equivalent to the time investment it takes you to get fairly proficient at cutting dovetails by hand. I think it probably takes a little longer to, to get good at hand cutting, um, but you have to look at the two different investments and which one's more valuable to you. The skills you learn when you're cutting by hand are actually skills that will be used elsewhere. Once you master how to put your jig together, that's a skill that can only be used to put that jig together. Uh, it's not a transferable skill, so you do have to weigh these things a little bit differently. But let's say you've got both down. You're pretty quick at cutting them by hand and you know how to assemble your jig in a jiffy. And then you're just down to cutting the drawers. I would say that if you're doing one drawer, I think a hand cut dovetail person who's not the best, we're not talking about a Rob Cosman here, we're talking about you know, just a regular person who's fairly proficient. I think at one drawer, the person doing it by hand could probably win out. Um, there's definitely a fighting chance. Once you get beyond that, once you start doing two drawers, three drawers, a chest of drawers, I think the jig wins, just because it's repeatable. That's what machines do. They're meant to, to do things in, um, you know, to do repeatable settings in great numbers, and that's what makes the jig more proficient. Um, bottom line is, I don't care what you use, use whatever you want to use. Just keep in mind that if you're really getting into the art of dovetail cutting, you're going to probably want to gravitate toward hand cut because you can really get those pins nice and thin in a way that just isn't actually possible with a dovetail jig. Matty38, quick question. How do you deal with insects in your shop, especially when finishing? I am pretty fortunate. You know, in Arizona, we actually don't have a lot of flying pests. For the most part, there are certain seasons where the flies pick up a little bit, um, but we don't have really a big mosquito issue. There's just not as much water and moisture. So a lot of times those um, flying bugs aren't nearly the problem that they are in other parts of the country. Try to work with your lacquers, with your shellacs, things that dry faster. The faster they dry, the less chance there is that something's going to fly down and sit on top of your finish. Oil-based finishes take longer to dry, better chance that you're gonna get a bug in there. The, the bugs may be inevitable, so if that's the case, make sure you know how to finish the finish, right? After your finish is dry, if you know how to prep that surface to get an absolutely smooth surface, even if a little bug flies in there, a gnat or something like that, you'll be able to abrade the surface and bring it up to whatever sheen you want using that sort of finish the finish methodology, and it won't really matter that much because you're gonna do a little bit of uh, abrasion after the fact. That may actually be one of the things that saves your, your, your bacon most of the time because sometimes you just can't control what the heck these bugs do. Coffee break. All right, Matthew S. says, I just bought my table saw based on your advice from the last episode. That's awesome. And have been making sawdust. I'm wanting to get into some hardwood. Can I handle rough lumber without a planer or jointer? Uh, Matthew, I'm not gonna say you can't. I'm just going to say it's going to be tricky. When you're dealing with rough lumber, you've gotta prep your faces, your edges, you've got quite a bit of work to do, and your jointer and your planer excel at those tasks. Everything else you do outside of those tools is going to be some sort of a compromise. Um, you can use your router to flatten a face using router rails. I've got a video that shows you how to do that. 
Uh, you could prep the edges using a router table. You could even build a sled for your table saw and get a nice clean edge on there. So those initial starting surfaces uh, can be done using the tools you currently have. It's just a lot more work. So I'm not gonna say you can't do it, I'm just gonna say be prepared to put a lot more sweat equity into it. Um, one of the things I recommend early on, especially with a toolkit like I recommended earlier, is that you buy your stuff pre-milled. Like eventually, if you're looking to add those milling tools to your collection, you'll get there, you know, but in the meantime, buy some S4S stock, get it into the shop as soon as possible. Better yet, if you could buy your stuff rough and have the shop that, or the, the lumber place you're buying it from, have them mill it up right then and there, uh, you'll be able to get it to your shop fast enough to incorporate it into a project where things start to move on you. Um, so yeah, it is possible. It's just something that's going to require quite a bit more work. Well, okay, Aaron's got a question about HVLP. It says, I'm thinking about buying a turbine sprayer, the Erlex you reviewed. I'm wondering if I should pay a little bit more for the extra air pressure option like your higher end model sprayer that you have. Personally, Aaron, uh, Erlex, I do believe is one of the best bargains in turbine HVLPs. But I do think if you spend a little bit more you can not only get a more powerful unit, but you also get one that has a higher quality hose that won't necessarily break if you step on it. Crap, it won't even break if you run it over with your car. Um, the parts on it are just a little bit higher quality and will probably last a little bit longer. And that is going into the Fuji line. I'm a, a big fan of Fuji's turbine sprayers. I've got the Q4. Prior to that, I owned the Q3. Well, since then, they actually came out with a number of mid-range and lower range, more budget-friendly models. I believe they call it the Hobby Pro. We gave one away yeah. a couple of months ago, didn't we? Yeah. Um, these are great units, and they're really competitive pricing-wise with the Erlex. So in my opinion, and this is not a knock against Erlex, I love them, the people at Erlex are great, and you should definitely consider them. Um, but for my money, I, I really like what Fuji is doing. So take a look at the Hobby Pro unit, uh, take a look at some of the other things they offer, and do a side-by-side -side comparison. I don't think you're gonna be disappointed with either if you go for Erlex or um, Fuji, but I think if you can spend a few more bucks and get a little higher quality hose, a little more powerful unit, you're overall gonna be happier with the results. You also may get a gun that has more um, fine tuning settings on it, which can be helpful. Do you put finish over a painted project? If so, what type of finish? Well, I don't usually paint my projects. That said, if you do have a paint, you can certainly use a compatible top coat. If you're using like a latex, you wanna go with an acrylic poly or something to, uh, to, to put on a couple extra coats of a clear coat that will help protect the paint. In a lot of cases though, paint, especially if you use good quality paint, paint is pretty darn protective in and of itself. So you may not need to do something like that, but keep like with like, you know? So if you're using water-based materials, then keep your top coat water-based as well. Um, the other thing to consider is, I don't know if you have a spray setup, but if you do, a great way for woodworkers to paint is by using pigmented lacquer. You could buy this or have a paint store make it up for you, uh, or you can make it yourself. I've got cans of UTC pigments that I use. I'll put those in my can of lacquer and spray that. Now you're actually getting a painted look with lacquer built in. So as you start to get to your, um, you know, you get the color that you want after three or four coats starts to build, then you can actually switch to a clear finish with the same lacquer, take the pigment out of there. And it gives you such an amazing depth and beautiful look that is really hard to achieve with traditional paint. And I've done that on a number of projects for clients in the past, and man, am I always, always happy with the results because it brings paint into the realm of what a lot of woodworkers are more comfortable with, which is clear finishes. You don't have to think too much about the paint aspect because it's coming along for the ride with the lacquer. So the next show is gonna be September 5th. That's the first Friday. I believe it is, yeah. First Friday of every month, we will try, as long as the, the time frame cooperates. Yeah. Last two have been on a Friday. Exactly. First Friday. Yeah. Uh, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, unless the clocks change. No, that's us that has the problem with the clocks. Yeah. Pacific will always be three hours different. Uh, but 1 p.m. Eastern, September 5th, Friday, tune in for that, because it's gonna be awesome. Uh, contact info if you wanna get in touch with us. Thewoodwhisperer.com is our main website. Uh, Thewoodwhisperer.com slash contact if you wanna send us uh, email about anything. Facebook.com slash The Wood Whisperer. When it's up. When it's up. Today it was down. Yeah. That was oh weird. Oh my gosh. Follow me at, at Wood Whisperer on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And again, if you have questions that you want to get to us, very quick, short questions, uh, use the hashtag TWWLive either on Twitter or Facebook and we'll be able to answer those. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that's it. It's been another great show. Thank you everybody for hanging out with us. And don't forget to enter the giveaway. TheWoodWhisperer.com slash giveaway. Yay. Clearview Cyclone. Awesome stuff. All right, thanks for watching, everyone, and uh, I guess we'll catch you next time.
High five. Oh yeah. I'm dancing now. Look at you. Look at you go. You copy my moves. <laughs>